to your seats, please. We want to start the next session. We're already a few minutes late. Um, as a health economist, um, I'm incredibly honored to be chairing the next session. Um, we are so um, grateful to have all of these fantastic health economists and development economists um, in um, Stellenbosch today. And in particular, um, yeah, I'm very grateful uh, that we um, that we can welcome um, the three people on the podium here. And um, yeah, without further ado, I will hand over the um, the microphone to Pascaline Dupois. Um, uh, she will be talking about what we've learned about um, microeconomic development and health over the past 20 years, right? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it's going to be a, a tough act to follow. The first session was really fantastic. Uh, let, me, let me try to do my best. Uh, so we'll talk about health for the next hour and a half. Health is obviously super important. It's a critical uh, component of well-being, not only as a consumption good. Life is much more pleasant to live when you, you are healthy and, and the, those you love are healthy. Uh, it's also a critical uh, form of capital. Um, it's a productive asset. It's, it's what contributes a lot to how much we can do. Good health is also, um, for yourself, is, is a source of externalities. You're less likely to pass on uh, diseases to others when you yourself do not have them. And on top of it, to deal with uh, poor health, you need um, expertise. You need, you need medical training uh, to help diagnose when people are suffering. And so for all three of these reasons, but also potentially more, um, we can't leave health to the market. We are going to need government uh, action, government participation, if not international cooperation, to make sure that uh, everyone has access to good health. Okay? So that's why it's all the more important to study health and to understand the determinants of health and what can be done, because it's a very critical, uh, important for policy. Now, let me start with the good news. The good news is if you look at what's called the Preston's curve, which is the relationship between health or life expectancy at birth as a measure of it, uh, and GDP per capita, over the past 100 years, um, 150 years, there's been an amazing rise in the Preston curve, which is that for the same amount of money, um, we can get way more health than before. Okay, so that's a really good news. If you compare what was going on in 1900 with uh, in 2000, you can see um, that you know at very low levels, uh, low levels of income in 1900, you couldn't uh, get very far in life. But with that same amount of income today, you can live way uh, longer. So that's uh, really great news. Um, in the past three decades, and that's where we're kind of uh, supposed to be focused on the, on the past 20 years, but I'm going to extend that to the past 30 years, uh, there's been also massive gains um, in certain aspects, in particular child mortality has declined quite a bit. As you can see from this figure, um, we still have uh, you know, substantial rates of uh, infant mortality, child mortality in Southern Africa and South, Southern Asia. But the rate has really declined uh, you know, very much uh, since 1990. So that's, that's very good news. Now, these gains are not observed everywhere. So if we look at some other uh, metrics, you know, we don't see as much. So this is maternal mortality. Uh, so the, the, this metric of the maternal mortality ratio, which is the share of women uh, who, who die uh, in giving uh, birth, and that has kind of remained flat over the past uh, 30 years in, in a number of, of countries. And maybe that's decreased a little bit, but really not as much as uh, you would want. So there are still a not, very uh, large number of challenges that remain. Uh, one is, um, oh, okay, I don't, I can, I, we can't click, okay. We can't click on links, okay? Just FYI, if you're presenting later, remove all the links, okay? Because you, you can't, <laughs> still have time, okay? Um, all right, so uh, you can't see the map, but uh, this was a map from our world in data showing that, um, uh, especially after COVID, uh, you know, the, the rate has actually increased uh, the share of people who are, uh, of kids who are stunted around the world, or the share of people who are malnourished uh, around the world, and it's estimated to be about one billion people who are still suffering from malnutrition around the world. Um, another big challenge that remains is that the environment uh, remains poor, okay? So when we've been, we've been talking about poverty alleviation, 
um, in the previous session. But one thing that uh, we're, you know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, in another form of poverty is in the quality of the environment that people face. And so the disease burden remains extremely high uh, in, in you know, what we call the global south. One example is malaria, which has still not been eradicated. And we you know, still do not have a vaccine that works great. I mean, there is a, a new vaccine that gives hopes, but it's, 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 it's only partially effective. Um, there is still a massive lack of access to clean water and to sanitation. There is lead contamination in many parts of the world. Um, there is no fluor in running water and no iodine in salt for most people uh, in the global south. And some of the environmental challenges are actually getting worse. Um, air quality is getting worse uh, as you know, um, cities become uh, uh, you know, uh, more industrialized. Climate change, obviously, uh, is a huge deal, and there is a massively uh, increased odds of highly unhealthy extreme weather events that are going to disproportionately affect poor countries, as you all know. Uh, and as there is a wave of uh, urbanization and uh, poor, you know, move away from uh, arid uh, areas that become uh, harder and harder to cultivate because of climate change and other reasons, and move towards urban areas, especially urban slums, you see a, f a shift in the focus of ill health from, uh, you know, rural areas, especially rural children that were the most uh, at risk, to essentially urban adults. And so I saw a study that estimated that the life expectancy in Mumbai slums, which is where the great majority of people in Mumbai live, they live in slums, uh, is only 44 years old. Um, sorry, life expectancy is 44. <laughs> um, and nowadays, in, in, in urban, um, in cities of Sub-Saharan Africa, the mortality rate for adults is actually higher uh, than in rural areas. Uh, on top of that, the health poor are getting harder to reach. Um, they can be uh, unreachable to do safety concern. There is uh, you know, uh, still a lot of conflict going around, and more than half of the extreme poor live in fragile or conflict-affected areas, which means that they are you know, often uh, not able to access even the basic services that we know can make a big difference in uh, survival. There is a lot of forced migration, with nearly 18 million people uprooted worldwide. Um, and obviously, with the current conflicts uh, in Ukraine and, and, and in Gaza, things are uh, getting worse by the minute. There are large inequalities within country. So many of the poor and st stunted today uh, and uh, those who face ill health are actually living in middle-income countries. Um, and as has been highlighted by a paper by Page and Pandey in 2019, uh, it means that you know, uh, increasing um, the level of health for these folks is going to be uh, all the more harder if um, the countries in which they live are not interested in uh, dedicating resources towards improving their health. Okay? Um, with, you know, not only within country, but also within the households, you can have inequality uh, or unequal distribution um, of resources of, of rights. Uh, and so now there's also some evidence that a lot of the uh, malnourished, uh, stunted uh, women um, uh, and often girls or um, you know, sons, if they are not the first uh, born, uh, are in non-poor households. Okay, so uh, Brown, Ravanian, and Van de Valle had an estimate that 75% of underweight women and undernourished children in Sub-Saharan Africa are not found in the poorest 20% of households, um, and are, or on a half are not found in the poorest 40%. So that means that just lifting people out of poverty is not enough to ensure uh, access to health for everybody. And in some work that I have done recently uh, with Radhika Jain, looking at um, you know, claims data from a large uh, healthcare program in, in Rajasthan, where people are supposed to get access to, to, to free care, we see that the share of uh, hospital visits done by women is a uh, 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 you know, far cry from what it should be if women had equal access to care. And so you know, this is a bit uh, small uh, to see, but the blue bars are the share of female patients among the patients that show up at the hospitals and getting care for these various specialties. And the uh, red crosses tell you what we should see if there was equal access to care based on what we know of the gender um, the prevalence of these different diseases. So for example, for the top left graph, we would expect to see about 50% of the patients who are between 15 and 49 for chronic, disease, uh, chronic kidney disease to be male, uh, sorry, to be female. Um, and we see uh, less than 30%, okay? And so the gap on all of these things between the blue bar and the um, red cross tells you uh, how much more we have to go for actually women to access uh, care in an environment where it's supposed to be uh, free for them. And so in our work, we've shown that this is evidence of you know, households choosing to invest less in the health of, of, of women than men. 
One area where uh, we have surprisingly little evidence, um, and you know, I made a mistake of using GDP. You know, it's a micro conference, so I should have used GDP. Uh, I should have just said like individual productivity. Um, but one area we actually don't know that much quantitatively about uh, the, the the cost of ill health is is, is productivity, which. No, it's kind of ironic because we, we, we know there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that if you're um, not feeling well, you're not very productive. Uh, in survey data, it's very clear that people lose a lot of days, uh, a lot of days of work um, to sickness. There's a, a recent paper in the Manila Journal that estimated that in Zimbabwe in 2019, uh, workers at banana plantations lost nine days of work to malaria per year. That's just for malaria, so then you can add the days that they lose to other diseases, and it really adds up. Um, and some uh, panel uh, survey that we've been doing with Marcel uh, Fashon in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, we asked people um, about um, uh, their health, and 38% of the sample from this region, like an urban area, uh, the greater Abidjan region, reported serious illness in the past 12 months, um, and condition of that, they, they, they lost 34 days of work uh, on average, with a median of 14, okay? Uh, and 7% of people said that they lost their job as a result. Okay? So we have a lot of ideas that, you know, presumably being in, in the house is going to be very bad for um, your productivity, your ability to, to, to get income, and especially in a context where people are self-employed. Uh, they don't have um, access to, you know, their wage is not going to be paid um, if they don't work. But yet we don't really have a good sense of the extent to which this matters more broadly. And I think it's, it's something that hopefully over the next, you know, the next 20 years we can do uh, much more work on that. I think it has a lot of implications. In fact, there's some really interesting recent work uh, uh, by Bassi et al. looking at um, firm organization and saying that, you know, uh, uh, an interesting feature of firms in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Uganda in their context is that it's a collection of individuals that all do, you know, the same thing instead of specializing. Um, and they put this... Uh, um, you know, on, on the account of like um, high unbundling costs that are, uh, remain to be specified, and I, I believe that uh, absenteeism due to illness could actually be one of these unbundling costs. Like, I don't want a production line if I, in expectation, you know, 10% of my workforce is not going to show up, and then the production line doesn't work if the person who is in the middle of the night is not there. Um, and so I'm safer if every one of my workers just does everything from A to Z, uh, build a door from A to Z, uh, rather than have a um, uh, risk to be the whole line is left, uh, you know, unused because of, um, uh, because of ill health. Um, there could also be, you know, implications for foreign direct investments, tourism revenue, all these things. We've, we've not really uh, quantified all this cost of ill health uh, for, for, the, for development. Uh, but what I want to focus on today is, is more kind of like uh, uh, what, what we've been able to do as microeconomists. Um, I'm going to you know, share with you that we've learned quite a bunch on, on, on how to improve health outcomes, uh, and in particular about the role of subsidies, uh, potential behavioral interventions with individuals uh, or providers to improve, improve take up uh, of, of, um, uh, of, 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 of medicines, of vaccines, to improve the quality of preventative and curative services. Um, but this is going to be kind of a gloomy presentation because um, I don't think we can go very far with that. Um, I think we've been looking, you know, at the lamppost where we can do stuff, but that's not where we're going to actually uh, see a big difference. If we want to get universal access to health, uh, we need to make uh, much more progress in terms of getting universal access to a healthy environment. And that means, like, you know, putting malaria eradication back on the table. I think it's a shame that this is not something that we discuss anymore. Uh, we need to prepare, and by that I mean sanitize cities for a uh, wave of urbanization that's already started and it's going to only uh, keep growing. We need to reduce air pollution. We need to do way more on climate change, post mitigation adaptation. And, you know, and, um, another aspect of the environment that's uh, uh, difficult is the social norms that people evolve within. And so eradicating discrimination against women, against you know, lower caste, as they are called, or ethnic minorities that make it harder for them to access um, the services that others have is also going to be very important. Um, so you know, we, we've made some progress uh, on what we could, but unfortunately, that's not enough. So what's the conceptual framework of the micro-development economists thinking about health? It's you know, pretty simple. We think that there are costs um, you know, and benefits, and we're going to weigh the costs against the benefits. Uh, the main determinants of the cost of access to care are going to be uh, essentially the distance to uh, where care is provided, 
um, the out-of-pocket charges that I'm uh, asked to pay when I show up there, and how much I have to wait um, when I get there. Okay, so that's, you know, all of these are gonna matter. So if I live very far from a facility, I don't have access to care. Um, if it's expensive to get the care, I can't afford it. Uh, if an expectation I have to wait six hours when I show up, obviously it's gonna prevent me from going if I need to take care of folks at home or I have you know, some, some food to put on the table. Uh, even if I show up and uh, get care, the impact this is going to have on my health is going to depend on the quality of the care that's there. Um, and so when we think about the quality of care, we think about the quality of the training for the providers, whether they've been, uh, you know, they are medical doctors or, or nurses, uh, and the quality of, of their training, the effort that they put forward. Um, so maybe they are trained well, but they don't have any uh, incentives to, to, to you know, put their knowledge to use. Uh, and also, obviously, the equipment or the infrastructure uh, or the technology uh, that they have. So I can be a trained doctor, and I know exactly uh, what to do when someone shows up uh, you know, uh, with heart palpitations. Uh, but if I don't have an EKG machi machine, uh, I can't actually check uh, you know, what's going on. Um, and then obviously there is some demand side issue possibly um, that you want to think about maybe, you know, even if there is a hospital nearby, uh, you know, the trust in the system may be low. And so we have now a good number of studies that have shown that uh, trust in the uh, formal uh, healthcare system is a challenge in especially a uh, context where you have a, a dire, uh, uh, somber uh, colonial history whereby colonial uh, you know, uh, powers uh, impose all sorts of um, you know, um, uh, terrible practices on uh, the population and, and, and uh, leads to uh, mistrust. Um, so you need, you need people to believe that going for care is gonna be good for them, for them to show in the first place. And then, as I mentioned, on the demand side, you may also have this commission within the household. Um, a lot of the work has focused on other aspects like forgetfulness, present bias, free writing. I'm going to argue that this is kind of like second order in a sense that, yes, that may be you know, a, a, uh, you know, a small explanation for why sometimes we don't avail ourselves of some things. Uh, but, but it's not going to be uh, really the, where the, 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 the big ticket is. So, Thinking about all the low-hanging fruits we've been able to pick over the past 20 years, um, and, and that's where I'm uh, somewhat self-serving and mentioning a, a bunch of my work, uh, you know, I think we've um, credibly shown that you know, it's pretty simple what you want to do. You just want to make a lot of stuff uh, free and easily accessible. Uh, to just make sure that people don't die of uh, communicable diseases that are, you know, we, we know how to deal with. And so, uh, you know, um, Banerjee, uh, Esther, um, Rachel, and co-authors have shown that free and easily accessible uh, vaccines are very important, and, and the, the easily accessible is very important there. So free is not enough. You also need to make, the, make sure that, um, that, 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 uh, that, that, they are, that they are there. Um, with, with Jessica Cohen um, and, and some other work I've done, we've uh, looked at uh, antimalarial bed nets and the extent to which making them free uh, really increases our coverage. And this is a context going back to what was discussed in the previous session where we don't have to be too worried about people doing the wrong thing or doing stupid things when they get uh, free supplies. You know, they're just like it's, you give them uh, a bed net, they actually are going to use it uh, to sleep under. They're not going to go and you know, fish with it or anything like that. Um, water treatment solution is another thing that uh, we've studied um, where we found that just making it available and free for people uh, help them, uh, you know, just have cleaner water, very simply, uh, and, and reduce uh, child morbidity and mortality. Uh, these things are highly cost-effective and, and very, very cheap. So the actual cost of producing, uh, you know, vaccines, the, the marginal cost of producing a, a, an instance of vaccine or a bed net, um, our water treatment solution, chlorine, is like really, really trivial. Uh, the cost of embedding distribution of these things in the existing healthcare infrastructure is also very trivial, and so it's like very easy to do. And by now, fortunately, most governments have been doing that at large, at least for vaccines and bed nets, not yet for water treatment solution, but that's something that we are working on, uh, trying to embed that into uh, the standard prenatal care package, among other things. Um, We've also learned that free and uh, easily accessible primary care uh, is, is important and can help uh, reduce uh, maternal and, and child uh, uh, you know, uh, mortality. Um, and then another 
uh, low-hanging fruit is school-based delivery. So you know, we know from the work on the warming that, that Ted was in the room, uh, that Miguel and Michael Kramer have worked on, um, you know, nutrients provided to young women and others uh, can help um, improve their health and, and also education outcome. Or we've done some work also on HIV education, so schools are an, an easy way to also, uh, you know, provide um, either actual treatment or prevention or information that can help people be healthier. So all of this were, you know, kind of the focus of the minimum development goals, how to make these things happen, you know, was still under question, but thanks to uh, the work that a bunch of us have been uh, doing for the past 10 to 20 years, we cannot like solve that problem of essentially distribution and making things available. And so now, um, you know, this is, this is essentially taken care of for the most part. So what's next? The not so low hanging fruits, um, one is improving the quality of health service provision. Okay, and so for that, we need to eradicate medical deserts. And there's this great paper by Edward OKK in Nigeria looking at the effect of you know, what he calls dro when a doctor drops from the sky, exploiting the you know, kind of like random misplacement of medical doctors during their year um, of uh, national service after graduating from medical school. And he shows the importance of a medical doctor. Okay? So having a medical doctor in the local clinic really makes a big difference. Uh, now, unfortunately, there is not enough doctors around. I mean, even in, in, in uh, many of the high-income countries, it seems like we have a dearth of doctors because people are aging, um, and, and the, the ratio of doctors to people needing care is not enough. And so we definitely need more doctors around the world. Okay, so uh, that's uh, you know maybe a uh, next. Um, uh, I don't know the relative cost effectiveness of, of subsidizing medical school for folks uh, around the global south, but that's something we should, we should think about. Now, if you can't have doctors, the second best uh, is uh, community health workers model. And so we have some great work uh, by uh, Martina and, 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 and Jakub, among others, uh, looking at uh, the effect of getting access to care through a community health worker, helping solve the last mile problem. Uh, and they find that this can uh, actually get uh, quite some ways uh, towards better health. Uh, a third best is to train uh, informal providers, um, if that's all you have, is informal providers who like pretend to be MDs when they are not. Uh, you can at a minimum, you know, instead of like kicking them out and saying you're, you, you're not qualified, move away and leave a dearth of care, uh, try to train them. So, uh, you know, Jishnu Das has done some work on that with Abhijit and others. Uh, Besides training people, you want also want to better manage the resources that you have. Um, so, uh, you know, that's somewhere, you know, there's been a lot of work on that, and the work on health is very, very related to the work uh, in education and, and other domains of public service delivery. So we've learned a lot collectively uh, on that issue. And I think what we've learned is that top-down accountability can be uh, quite difficult. So. Um, again, uh, Abhijit and Esther and others, uh, as well as uh, Iqbal Daliwal and Rima Hanna, have looked at the extent to which you can um, have like sanctions for health workers who don't do their job. Uh, this, these sanctions can um, have uh, very little bite if uh, you know, very quickly people realize that their, their supervisors are not going to be uh, actually implementing these sanctions. And so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not that easy to have top-down accountability because you know, even if there's someone monitoring what you do, maybe there's no one monitoring what the monitor is doing, okay? And who's gonna monitor the monitor of the monitor? Okay, so that's, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, but on accountability is an alternative. Like, you know, the, every, you know the, the folks who actually benefit from the services have the most, the most at stake in trying to claim uh, what is owed to them. Um, and that, you know, has been, um, uh, potentially a good uh, avenue to, 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 to go from super bad to not, still bad, but not that bad care. And so, uh, again, that's, that's where, uh, you know, Martina is going to be uh, talking later uh, with, with Jacob Svensson. and I've done some work as well, showing uh, the extent to which you can uh, empower uh, people to um, ask more from their local health workers. But it seems to be harder to use this bottom-up uh, approach when you've reached uh, a minimum level and you're trying to go from, you know, okay to great, okay? That it seems like harder for, uh, for people to, to, to be able to, 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 to move up um, along the quality ladder just through bottom-up uh, accountability. Um, so an alternative 
It's a different form of, of uh, top-down is financial incentives for providers. And here, um, you know, the results have been mixed. If you have providers who know how to do their job, then paying them to do, uh, to do better can work because they know how to do better, so you can incentivize them. But in many contexts, we are back to this issue of the quality and the fact that they don't have the training. So if, if you don't know how to do better, paying them to do better is not going to be enough. Um, and so in, in a context where there is a no-do gap, I know stuff, but I have no incentives to put it to good use, you can incentivize me financially. In a context where the amount I know is, is very li little, uh, that's not going to be uh, enough, and there's some evidence uh, of that from our Rwanda um, by Basing et al. Or, or, or the DRC by uh, Elisabeth Hui and Jules Seymour. Um, another set of not so low hanging fruits is um, you know, the availability of drugs or medicines. There's a problem of counterfeits uh, in many uh, areas, again, an area that Martina has worked on. Uh, in, in um, you know, showing that many of the, of the drugs available are actually um, not as potent as they should be. Uh, and we are well aware of the problem of neglected diseases and the lack of innovation in the diseases that the only you know, affect the poor, uh, because the poor are not going to be able to pay for the medicine, and so there's no incentives for innovation. And so that's where uh, you know, uh, uh, Michael Scrammer's work on advanced market commitment uh, is potentially uh, super, super important. Um, that, that's one reason why uh, I thought you should get the Nobel Prize, but that's not why you got the Nobel Prize. So maybe we'll get a second one. Um, now, uh, another area that's not as easy is um, health insurance. So a lot of countries have been trying to move towards universal health insurance by providing uh, public health insurance to the poor, uh, you know, making uh, uh, hospitals um, provide free care for the poor and, and, and paying hospitals for that. Um, now, it's not that easy. Uh, there is some um, evidence from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Ghana, from Cote d'Ivoire, and, and uh, also from Indonesia, that uh, enrollment is a challenge. So when you ask people to, to pay a premium for insurance, uh, they often don't take it up. Uh, that may be related to the issue that were mentioned in the first session, that you ask people to pay in advance for, um, you know, uh, at, at the time when they don't have... Um, very much uh, cash. Trust, I think, you know, is a big, big, big issue in the context of insurance. Uh, even when they do sign up, utilization uh, is a challenge among enrollees, uh, you know, broadly, as shown in India by Melanie et al., uh, but also specifically for uh, women, as we've shown uh, with Radhika Jain. Uh, my author Radhika Jain also has a, a wonderful paper looking again at Rajasthan, where she shows that uh, hospital fraud is common when it comes to health insurance. So hospitals, you know, uh, doing all sorts of fishy stuff to get more money out of the scheme, which means that it's, it's pretty easy for a public health insurance scheme to go bankrupt uh, if hospitals are milking too much out of it. Uh, we've also found non-compliance with program rules. So again, it's the concept of Rajasthan, but also in Tamil Nadu uh, and now in Andhra Pradesh, we've been able to ask patients who benefit from care uh, provided under these uh, health insurance schemes in India uh, whether or not it was truly free and we find very large rates of out-pocket charges. So hospitals not only get reimbursed by the you know, insurance program, but also charge patients for money they shouldn't pay. Um, so I think this is an area where we need much more work to really understand how to design a public health insurance scheme that are going to be successful at getting people uh, access to care more broadly. And it's a very uh, rich you know, area for experimentation in partnership with governments because they are really trying to do a lot uh, and have a lot of questions, and I think we should, uh, we should do more to help them. Now, the irony is what we've learned in these past 20 years of research is that it looks to be what um, you could call the inverted model of healthcare, which is that in the end, we, what we have is private provision of public goods. So what do I mean by that? is that these solutions that we've identified um, are really not a first best, because de facto we are getting individuals to pay the effort cost of using bad nets instead of having you know, malaria eradication. Individuals have to pay the cost of cl cloating their water every time they fetch water, instead of just getting clean water through the pipe. They have to pay the cost of digging pit latrines instead of just getting access to sewage and sanitation. They have to pay the cost of using an air purifier instead of just getting clean air. They have to pay the cost of maintaining their clean cook stoves instead of just getting uh, electricity uh, on, the grid, on the grid and using an electric one. So in practice, we are asking people to do so much stuff, so much stuff, 
Yes, we have a solution. If you get a bed net and a clean water and a clean crew stove and this and that, you can be healthier. But it's so much. It takes so much of people's mental bandwidth just to think about all that stuff. So it's no surprise that at some point, you know, they can't, they can't do everything. Uh, and that's not how it should be. Like, we don't have, I mean, at least for, you know, those of us um, like me who, who, who live in the comfort of uh, Princeton, New Jersey, we don't have to think about any of that stuff because everything is clean. The environment is entirely clean and our health is not at stake. And then what we seem to be seeing is like public provision of what you could call private goods. So there's essentially primary care investments. Um, so you know, the, the, the little stuff that maybe doesn't have that much of, a, of an externality, uh, you know, just getting, uh, getting um, uh, you know, treated for, for, for basic illnesses, that can happen in the primary care facility. Um, but you know, the bigger hospitals, the one that you know, maybe help deal with diseases that have more of a, you know, uh, social consequences are left behind. So, you know, what I want to, I guess I'm, I'm already running out of time, which is unfortunate. <laughs> um, that, you know, for me, all of this stuff we've worked on was, you know, I've like, poured my heart and soul into it, but it's kind of like whatever we could make a difference on, but it's really not enough. Uh, and we need, uh, you know, to, do, to, do, to, to think much harder about uh, universal access to a healthy environment as being a key requirement for universal access to healthcare. And so, as I said before, we need to put malaria eradication back on the table, prepare cities for uh, the wave of urbanization, reduce air pollution, think about climate change. Um, now, these big ticket items, they are really hard to make progress on, okay? A bunch of them are global goods, okay? So malaria eradication, TB eradication, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, all of this, this is like, these are global goods. We need to rethink, you know, the mere fact that we have borders. Okay? Uh, when we are creating uh, climate change here, you know, up there uh, in, in the north uh, and, and making it much harder for people to live in the south, how can we possibly keep our borders closed? They're just morally wrong. Uh, but then who is a social planner at the global level who's going to change that uh, calculation? Uh, and then there are some national level policies that are also very important, uh, preparing, you know, certainizing cities for wave urbanization. We know from what has happened among uh, high income countries that the ways through which you really get massive gains in health is by investing in infrastructure, in sewerage. Uh, and we have a very, very recent paper by uh, Claire Lepo at the Paris School of Economics, a job market paper, is looking at the effect of treating wastewater in urban uh, cities in India, and she finds very big effects on child mortality. So we know how to um, you know, increase health quite a bit through these big infrastructure investments that just don't happen enough. Um, when the Cote d'Ivoire was going to host uh, the Africa Soccer Cup or something like that, um, I saw that they very quickly built a whole, uh, you know, a whole village for the, you know, <laughs> for the players. And I was like, well, that's great. You know, when the, the, the soccer club is finished, maybe they can just like have people move in and live in these things. Like if you can very quickly build an athlete's, uh, a village for athletes, why can't you very quickly build, um, you know, how do you call it? Like, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, how do you call it, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, public housing, uh, so that when people come in from their urban, the rural areas, they don't have to live in, in uh, unsanitary slums. They can immediately move in areas that have sewerage, um, you know, uh, connected to the water and the electricity grid, um, and live just like athletes. Um, another aspect where you need, um, you know, national level policies is to try to eradicate discrimination against, you know, against women, against uh, lower caste or ethnic minorities. Um, unfortunately, at both this global good level and the national level, you have issues of political will. And so, you know, it's hard to think about any other topic that we're going to be discussing uh, today without thinking hard about uh, governance uh, and political economy. Um, but at the national level in particular, uh, there can be sometimes issues of state capacity, which is another area with fruitful uh, work. But right now, we have this additional problem that there's crippling debt for most countries uh, in the global south. And so that means that uh, it's really hard even for you know, even a, 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 a government that has solved the political issue, uh, solved uh, the state capacity issue, to do anything. And so the quick question is, who should pay for what I'm talking about? Who should pay for malaria education effort, for TB eradication? Um, and here I would like to bring the example of PEPFAR, okay? So PEPFAR has been, uh, by some account, uh, and this is a quote from a CGD blog, the most significant global response to a single disease in history, okay? And the most successful U.S. foreign aid program since the Marshall Plan. 
And at the time it was put in place, a lot of us were like, you know, uh, holding our nose because it was bush and it was like, it came along with some like, okay, don't use condoms because we don't like uh, sex for fun type of stuff. So we were kind of like, huh, not so great. But in hindsight, it was an amazing program that has really saved the lives of so many people. Um, and, and you can, you know, you think of this as maybe a model for uh, other things we could do. And so when I think about, you know, uh, Africa in particular, uh, former colonial powers such as France and the UK have never done anything, anything like that, you know. And so I would like to propose that we create a Marshall Plan uh, against malaria, or a Marshall Plan for sewerage uh, and water access, and just invest uh, resources in terms of preparing, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, cities so that urbanization in poor countries can come along with, with better health. Um, and Bill Gates, um, uh, it doesn't seem to think that uh, you can eradicate malaria through a big campaign the way it was eradicated from Brazil and Sri Lanka and in India back uh, in, the, you know, uh, uh, in the middle of the century. Uh, I disagree with Bill Gates. I think that uh, he is not, um, he's too optimistic when he thinks that you can get there through piecemeal programs, uh, and we shouldn't give up on the ambition of having a big international effort. So to conclude, uh, you, know, you know, the good news is that the health has improved more in the past 100 years than, than ever before, uh, including in, in, in the poorest countries. Um, it's been largely the result of the development and spread of cheap, effective technologies such as vaccines, uh, with big improvements in preventive care, um, contributing to the, the, the decline in child mortality over the, fa the past uh, few decades in particular. Uh, but, you know, when I think about what's next, I'm happy to see a lot of work on health systems, and I, uh, I understand why this is where we are focusing, because that's where we can maybe most easily identify solutions, but it's not going to be enough. The big elephants in the room uh, need to be dealt with to achieve universal health, and that's essentially fixing uh, you know, the, the environment, and I speak uh, about that uh, in both terms. That won't happen without global coordination. Uh, the bad news about COVID is that we know that global coordination did not go that great when it came to COVID, so we really need to do better. Um, and within uh, national countries, it won't happen through the Ministry of Health alone, because these are global uh, issues. So the same way, you know, you need uh, the Ministry of Education may be the best place to ensure that there is deworming of children or, or HIV education happening or in the work that we've done in Ghana. You know, by subsidizing education, you can also improve uh, child outcomes, but you also need in the context of uh, urbaning, uh, urbanization to coordinate with, uh, you know, whomever is the urban planner and things like that. So uh, it's just, health is just not its own uh, sector. Uh, we need to work uh, more broadly. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Pascaline. I must say, it was, I could see Pascaline has gone over time, but it was such a great contribution and so valuable. I couldn't bring myself to stop her, which um, I must apologize for. Next, we have um, Kelsey Jack from University of California, San Barbara, responding to um, Pascaline's um, presentation. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I'm also going to kind of respond by expanding a little bit. And what I want to talk about is environmental health threats in particular. So this is going to pick up on kind of the, the theme that you started, Pascaline, of, of thinking about the environment that people live in. And then also the kind of distinction between what's publicly provided versus what people have to uh, provide for themselves. So. Environment influences health, uh, and, and this is kind of, I think for most of us, we, we tend to take it for granted, but it's as fundamental as you know, the water you drink, the air you breathe, and if we kind of paint the cartoon of a rich household versus a poor household, how does this look? This is kind of really very much echoing some of, some of what you said. If we think about water, for example, the high-income household you know, turns on the, that's supposed to say tap, and uh, clean, treated water comes out 24 hours a day. Whereas a low-income household has to fetch water using valuable time that could be put to other uh, important uses, has to take care of treatment at home, has to run out if they do happen to have tapped water, uh, if they don't plan ahead. If we think about air quality, the high-income household probably lives in a neighborhood or country with clean air. 
The government enforces the regulations that are on the books that make sure that that air is actually clean. When they commute, they commute in a well-sealed vehicle so they're not exposed to the ambient air quality around them. Whereas the low-income household across the world, and this includes in rich countries, tend to live in much dirtier neighborhoods, neighborhoods with worse air quality. Their homes may not be as well sealed, so even if they can invest in some kind of air purification, it's not going to be as effective. And they face trade-offs between income earning opportunities and their exposure to pollution. And so, you know, very much uh, echoing Pascaline's point, this is really placing the burden of self-protection, of guaranteeing a clean environment and therefore good health on the poor, whereas most of us, we sort of get to, to take it for granted and not invest uh, the same kinds of time and resources into it. So, sort of aggregate numbers, this is a somewhat outdated WHO uh, data suggests that, that roughly a quarter of the burden of disease, both in terms of mortality and morbidity, comes from environmental health threats. These are primarily water and air quality. If you break this share down by uh, GDP, this share is largest in low and middle income countries, perhaps unsurprisingly. And it's really been in the last couple of decades, which is what we're uh, focused on here today, that causal estimates going beyond these kind of aggregated global bur burden of disease style numbers to causal estimates of just how much is the environment uh, affecting health have really started to, uh, to emerge. This is true both in development economics, but actually also in environmental economics, where I also spend, uh, spend a lot of my time. And I think part of the reason that it's taken so long to really start to unpack these relationships is these are really challenging things to measure. Right? So to be able to make progress on this, we need to know something about how good is air quality, how good is water quality. Uh, this is expensive data, it's data that's hard to interpret. And then we also have to be able to associate it with health outcomes, which is a really huge challenge. On top of that, there are massive identification problems. So people who value clean air, who have higher ability or willingness to pay for clean air, for example, will tend to move to cleaner neighborhoods. And therefore, it's really hard to separate out what is exposure versus what is selection, right? And so this, is, this has created challenges where a lot of the evidence that we have comes from very short-run fluctuations, for example, in environmental quality as opposed to the stuff that may really matter, which is your lifetime uh, of exposure. What have we learned? Uh, I've got, I'm going to have a, a bunch of references on these uh, slides, which will hopefully be helpful for those who um, want to look at them later. So uh, again, I think echoing some of what Pascaline said, there's been a ton of research in water on self-protection. And that is in part because it is easy to study self-protection. It is also in part because that's been where a lot of the effort has been. And so, you know, this is a very, very partial list of all of the RCTs that are trying to understand who takes up different forms of filters, of chlorine, of, of, of different kinds of things that ultimately mean, you know, whether it's switching from a dirty spring to a clean spring, whether it's, you know, pouring solutions into your, into your water, it's all stuff that is the burden is placed on the household. You know, as Pascaline said, it can be incredibly cost effective. It can be really important for health. There's a, a smaller number of studies in terms of, of water, and I think you had some sites that, that I didn't have of thinking either about regulation as an effective means of improving the quality of water that people have access to or large infrastructure projects. The important thing here is these depend hugely on state capacity. Right, so the self-protection has the, the, the slight advantage of it's up to the household, whereas the, the publicly provided version of clean water really does depend on the, on the quality of, of, of government inputs. Contrast this a bit with, with thinking about ambient air quality, you know, the air around us, what we're, what we're breathing in. This is a much harder problem in some ways because both from a research standpoint and a provision standpoint because it's by nature a public good, right? And so the burden of disease depends not just on the ambient air quality but also how many people are in that airshed 
uh, actually breathing it? What are the behaviors that, that they're undertaking? And this has been an area where, again, the research has really improved hugely in part because of improvements in data. And so, you know, Seema uh, Jayachandran has a, an early paper taking advantage of the availability of satellite data. I think this is the first in a, in a lower middle income country to actually look at satellite data as a measure of pollution. And this really changes the game in some ways in terms of what we can measure because suddenly we can see the world and see which places are more polluted and see which places are less polluted, whereas all of the work previously depended on monitoring stations, which themselves are a public good, which themselves depend on government provision. They're not always cited randomly. They're often not cited in the low-income areas that are, uh, that are the most polluted. Here we have a lot of evidence, again, focusing on, on infants and in utero exposure in part because we don't have this sorting problem with infants or, or, uh, or unborn children in the same way that we have with adults, where choices that they've made over their lifetime may hugely affect the amount of, uh, of exposure. And the, and the estimates are huge. In utero exposure to, to poor air quality has really big, important uh, health impacts. That's just the immediate association between a relationship causal impact, ideally, between, uh, between environmental quality and health. We have a lot of literature suggesting that this goes beyond just health. This affects later in life outcomes. This affects uh, labor market returns, productivity, cognition. Some of this is about contemporaneous exposure. If you take a test on a more polluted day, students do worse on those tests. If you, take, uh, if you, if you look at productivity, again, in polluted days versus unpolluted days, productivity is higher on less polluted days. Not looking at environmental variation, but we can sort of combine this with the idea that we also know from other studies that improving uh, 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 health, improving life expectancy, changes people's human capital investments, changes people's uh, long, life, long life incomes. We should probably expect similar, similar relationships in terms of exposure to, uh, to poor environmental quality. Now, stepping back just a little bit, I want to think just, just a bit about some of these trends, like Pascaline, I find it very convenient that a lot of these kind of trend uh, graphs are available for us to, you know, to easily look at to, to make some kind of a point. So this is looking at the share of the population not using an improved water source. So this is the, the share of the population uh, consuming untreated water. This has fallen pretty dramatically. It's still high in low-income countries relative to a lot of the rest of the world, but it has improved a lot. And this is, again, in part probably because of these efforts to increase access to these kinds of self-protection. This is in some ways a private good. This is something that individuals can take action on. As incomes improve, uh, uh, they, they, they can do it. If we contrast that with, with air pollution. This is a little bit of a different kind of statistic. This is a share of deaths attributed to air pollution across the same time window. You don't see those same gains. Contrast that with indoor air pollution. This is more of the self-protection. This is more of what people have a bit of control over. This is primarily associated with people's cooking technologies. Here, there are downward trends everywhere except for the, the kind of low-income countries are a bit more stuck. But what that implies is this previous figure, this is, a lot of this is coming from ambient exposure. This is related to the urbanization trends that Pascaline was describing. It's related as well to just the fact that as countries industrialize, air quality often gets worse. So holding fixed kind of ambient environmental quality within a location what do we know about the relationship between income and exposure? So this is not income, these are not these kind of aggregate relationships between how good is the air quality, how high is the country's GDP. This is rather within a location, how does income affect your own personal exposure? There's an emerging literature that starts to suggest that, that it is quite important. And so a few of the kind of uh, strands that come out of that. One is just spatial. It's where do people live? They tend to live in more polluted neighborhoods. I mentioned that before. But it's also where they work. 
So lower income, uh, lower income individuals are more likely to be working in more exposed occupations, occupations where maybe they're working by the side of the road, maybe they're working in agricultural settings where they're exposed to pesticides, but also where they commute. They're commuting longer distances in transportation that is much more open and exposed to the very, very high uh, uh, pollution loads uh, along the roads. There's evidence that the use of cleaner fuels increases with income, so that as households get richer, they're switching from cooking with charcoal, cooking with firewood, these extremely damaging for, for own health types of technologies, to gas and eventually, ideally, to, uh, to electricity. There's also evidence that willingness to pay, which is often, at the end of the day, measuring kind of ability to pay, is uh, for self-protection, for, uh, for air filters, for these water quality studies that, uh, that, that, that Pascaline and I have both mentioned, that those are increasing in income. But also, really importantly, it's not just about necessarily growth, but some of the themes that came up uh, in the first panel, access to credit, education, but also information. So there's a suite of new papers suggesting that something that is publicly provided, which is information about environmental quality, can have a really big impact on people's ability and willingness to take action uh, to, improve their own, uh, to improve their own exposure or to reduce their own exposure. So kind of looking backwards, there's been just this huge rise, and really it's, it's again, both in environmental economics and in development economics, of really trying to unpack this causal relationship that in some ways is very, very difficult between the quality of the environment and, uh, and health outcomes. Field experiments have been great at unlocking sort of relationships in terms of what are some of the constraints to a cleaner environment, but they're much harder to think about these things like ambient, you know, municipal level, uh, airshed type of variation, right? For that, there's been a lot more reliance on natural experiments, on high frequency variation in things like air pollution. Again, this really limits what we can know about people's lifetime exposure. That is a much, much harder uh, problem. The sort of depressing thing that comes out of this a bit, though, if we go back to those trends, is that these things that are both harder to understand and that are you know, very much public goods, they're the ones that are not improving, right? The stuff that people have a bit more control over, those are the things where the trends are really moving in the right direction. So this is, you know, this is challenging. I think there's sort of a suggestion between the patterns that, that I've been describing that we could think of something like a sort of pollution-based poverty trap where if pollution makes you, you know, poorer, makes your cognitive performance worse, therefore that means you're more likely to live in a dirty neighborhood later on, that this is something that is actually somewhat difficult uh, to escape from. So if you thought that was depressing, I have to talk about climate just a little bit. Um, so there's going to be a panel on climate uh, uh, later today, I believe, and so you'll get to hear some of the just direct effects of climate on health, things like if it's hot enough, people do in fact uh, die a lot, they have conflicts, they have you know, lots of other kind of immediate health impacts. I want to put that into just a tiny bit of, of perspective. Again, the attribution is challenging in these types of statistics, but if we look at the kind of best estimates of the burden of disease from air pollution, globally the estimate suggests that it's causing about 6.5 million premature deaths per year. If we compare that to current estimates of the premature deaths from climate change, they are an order of magnitude smaller. That is not to say climate change is not a crisis, that is not to say any of that, but it is to say that there is this kind of health emergency that has been going on for decades at this point that we really haven't made that much progress on, which you know, is all the more depressing if we think about kind of this impending uh, challenge. So the estimates are by end of century, something like three million premature deaths from climate change. So this is certainly a very rapidly increasing uh, health threat. But the other thing that is going to be challenging is to kind of bring it back to the broader set of health challenges uh, that, that Pascaline was, was uh, touching on, is that climate is going to exacerbate all of them. 
So a lot of this progress that we have made on you know, disease, et cetera, et cetera, the scientific literature suggests that climate can make almost all of those things worse. It can also make them emerge in places where we have developed less resilient systems, including our own immune systems. Uh, so you know, I think, to me at least, this is one of the biggest uh, challenges to think about going forward, a place where economists really should be devoting some of their energy to trying to understand causality and to trying to understand potential solutions. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and now um, to our final respondent, Martina Bjorkman Nikevich, <laughs> I tried, um, from the Stockholm School of Economics. Um, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Martina. Thanks. Uh, so thank you, Pascaline, and thank you, Kelsey, for um, great and insightful presentations. Um, I'm not going to respond to this. I'm um, more going to uh, kind of confirm partly what Kelsey has said and, and also what Pascaline has said. So um, I'm not going to talk much about what we have learned in the last 20 to 30 years, but I'm mainly going to highlight uh, a few uh, challenges or areas or regions where I see that we need uh, to put more research uh, and effort into uh, when it comes to health. So, um, as Pascaline uh, showed in, in her presentation, we have seen massive improvements in global health uh, over the past 100 years, but uh, also especially during the last 20 to 30 years. Despite this uh, progress, we have uh, huge inequities that persist, and uh, the gains in health uh, has not been uniform across regions. Uh, and uh, we are now in a region that is uh, lagging behind in particular, so sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, as, uh, when we look at, at maternal mortality, for example, in uh, uh, we have seen decreases in maternal mortality rates in, in many regions in the world, uh, while it's been pretty stagnant in the last 20, 30 years in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. If we look at uh, child death, for example, uh, which is a measure that we like to use when we measure health, uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it, children are very sensitive to changes in, in health, uh, we have also seen uh, amazing and uh, um, pretty impressive uh, improvements in, in child mortality across the world, also in sub-Saharan Africa, mainly due to improved quality and quantity of healthcare, uh, better uh, public service provision, and especially better preventative healthcare, such as immunizations, we know how to treat diarrhea, we are treating children uh, who are sick at uh, early stages. Most of these deaths that happens, they happen uh, below the uh, age of one. Uh, and also here, Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, made uh, fantastic progress uh, over the last 20, 30 years. However, uh, when we look at the, the number of child death in the world, 50% of them today happens in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And this number was 20% in the 1990s. So if we want to uh, decrease the number of child death, uh, we need to figure out how to improve child health in the Sub-Saharan Africa region, especially. Similarly, uh, on other uh, health indicators where Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, performing worse than other regions in the world. Uh, one of them is uh, HIV uh, AIDS, both death and prevalences and spread. So uh, three decades ago, HIV AIDS was a problem for the world. Uh, and then we had uh, a fantastic medical uh, innovation, which are the antiretroviral therapy drugs. In countries and in regions where we have the health system functioning well, those drugs are going to be reached by people who are sick with HIV and they're going to be able to live until long uh, age. In areas where you have institutions and health systems where uh, these drugs cannot be distributed at regular intervals or even where money is lacking for provision of these, uh, they are not going to um, fix the problem of HIV death. So today, uh, HIV death 
uh, or sorry, AIDS death and HIV prevalence and HIV spread is mainly a, a problem of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and, uh, uh, and, and it's both the spread and the death rates are very high. And then as, as Pascaline said, uh, and for obvious reasons as well, malaria death is a problem that is almost unique to the Sub-Saharan Africa region. So I think one of the kind of challenges ahead or one of the, um, one of the challenges ahead is that if we want to um, if we want to get rid of disparities in health outcomes across the world, which is something we would like, want to do, we should put intensified focus and we should uh, focus on more targeted intervention that look at these specific health outcomes that we have specific problems for in Sub-Saharan Africa or that are where Sub-Saharan Africa is lagging behind. So one of them is, of course, eradicate malaria, put that back on the table, as Pascaline said, and urgently. Uh, it is uh, uh, more than 600,000 uh, people dying every year from malaria eradication. The other one is uh, we need to figure out why maternal mortality is so high in the Sub-Saharan Africa region and how do, we, uh, how do we decrease it. We need to continue work on uh, programs uh, that, and strategies that decrease the spread of uh, HIV, prevention uh, for HIV. And uh, the, the final part about uh, um, kind of Sub-Saharan Africa lagging behind is that uh, we need to put more research and focus into how to improve child health in the Sub-Saharan Africa region if we want to decrease the large number of child deaths that we see in the world. The second uh, kind of challenge is a challenge that I think by now that we all in this panel, uh, so Kelsey, Pascaline and me agree on, is that uh, one of the biggest challenges in health is actually climate related. Uh, so, um, we heard from Pascaline uh, and Kelsey talk a lot about that uh, climate change is uh, disproportionately affecting both nations and communities that are already burdened by poverty and malnutrition. And we also know that um, uh, climate scientists are predicting that health is going to be the primary channel, actually, through which climate change is going to affect human welfare in low-income countries. This is going to happen through uh, new diseases that comes with climate change, more intense floodings, fires and droughts, and this is going to uh, create uh, challenges for sanitation and drinking water concerns. Uh, we're going to have ecological disruptions, which is going to uh, create challenges for agricultural production and hence uh, creating more famine as well. So we need to uh, think about uh, how to um, uh, and again, sorry, so again, uh, in a paper just published in uh, 2022 by uh, Carlton and Greenstone and eight to ten other co-authors in, uh, in QG, they estimate that the mortality impacts by the end of this century, using the climate models we have, using uh, temperatures and how we know that they affect mortality rates, uh, we, uh, the health outcomes is going to be particularly severe in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa caused by climate change. So uh, in order to deal with these climate change issues, there is an urgency to really think about our health systems in general and whether our health systems are built uh, for climate change and for uh, building climate resi resilient health systems. So. Um, we know, and in this audience, we have several co-authors, including Dave Donaldson, Robin Burgess, uh, Seema, and we have Mikey Greenstone and others who have already studied uh, quite a lot on direct and indirect impact of climate change on health. But I think we need to know much more here. So what are the both direct and indirect impacts of climate change on uh, health of the poor population in low-income countries? But in, in addition to understand the impact of climate change, which is important, I also think we need to start uh, thinking about the health systems that we have. And maybe not only the health system, but also the type of providers that we have, and how these providers can mitigate uh, the impact uh, that climate change is expected to have on uh, health. 
So um, um, Pascaline uh, mentioned one of the, the papers that I have with Jacob where we uh, look at community health workers and we find that they are very efficient. Uh, one of the entrepreneurial community health worker programs in Uganda were very efficient for decreasing child mortality. We now uh, have a, a working paper where we looked at how these community health workers, whether they were able to mitigate kind of weather shocks that happened during the period uh, uh, compared to control areas that didn't have these efficient community health workers. And we do find that if you have efficient community health workers in the villages that had these efficient community health workers, they were able to, uh, to actually reduce the impact of uh, heavy rainfall shocks or climate change uh, shocks in the period of our study, while in the control areas, mortality rates uh, escalated and increased in, in periods uh, of uh, heavy rainfall. But we need to understand much more what type of providers and what they can do and how they can mitigate these type of health impacts. And um, finally, uh, or not finally, but uh, almost finally, as Pascaline said, we have learned a lot these past 20 years. I think your presentation covered it, literally all what we know about these massive improvements in health that we have been able to do and learn about. And uh, by using uh, Esther's word of uh, the plumbing tool, uh, RCTs, we have learned about which programs work, which do not work, and we've been able to figure out a lot of these preventative care programs that actually are functioning. Uh, we have the deworming program, we know it works, it's scaled up and, and working well. We know a lot about immunization campaigns, we know a lot about anti-malarial bed net programs, uh, clean water solutions, and so on. Uh, what we also know, and what the RCTs have given us, is that we know that investing in health is extremely cost-effective. So, um, investing in health programs is actually the most cost-effective way that you can spend your dollars today. So, if you look at the Give Wells ranking of the most cost-effective programs or charities that we have today, the top four of them are health, preventative health programs. Malaria medication, bed net programs, uh, vitamin A supplements and vaccination programs. So these are programs we should be investing in. However, uh, the other big challenge we have is, we know these programs work, but how do we scale them up to reach the broader population? And how do we ensure that these programs are working when they're scaled up? So, uh, it's challenging to use the results from pilot studies to draw conclusions about policies implemented at scale. So we have market equilibrium effects, we have context dependence, we have site selection bias, piloting bias. And what is the capacity for these organizations and governments to scale up the program and how can they manage that capacity uh, within their organizations while scaling up? As Pascaline mentioned, uh, the Power to the People paper that we evaluated in Uganda in 2004 was found to be a very uh, effective bottom-up accountability approach for fighting child mortality. Uh, a similar program was, uh, was uh, uh, implemented in Sierra Leone with a very similar baseline health picture, bad uh, child mortality numbers, uh, pretty bad uh, performance in the public health system. They also found in Sierra Leone that this bottom-up accountability program worked. Uh, ten years later, uh, um, we had Doug Parkinson and researchers doing a similar Power to the People program in Uganda, the same context as me and Jacob have been working on. Ten years later, child mortality rates had decreased, uh, the public sector had improved their health deliveries, and they could not replicate our results on child mortality. But it was a very different context than 10 years earlier. So clearly, how to scale programs, how they work, depends on so many things. And just knowing that one program works in 2004 doesn't ensure that we know it works in 2024 or even to 2014. So why do some programs scale and why, 
others have little success, citing John List. It's not luck, it's not skill, it's actually scientific method. And I think we should take these health programs that we know work very well and think about how we can actually use scientific method to scale those programs. So we have a, a few studies that actually have experimentally studied whether positive results from pilot studies carry through once the program runs at scale. And the most, kind of, uh, the most, the most famous and most kind of rigorous kind of scale up is uh, Esther and Abidji's work with Pratam on the teaching at the right level program where they tried it in many different regions with different providers, different number of days, really iterating the, the process of the teaching at the right level program to make it work at scale. Uh, Progressa program is another program which started small and then expanded and has been scaled up. However, I think uh, we need to spend more time on taking these lessons learned in the 20 to 30 years back in time on health uh, and think about how we can scale them up uh, to larger program and what the scientific method for that should be. And again, I'm, I'm just going to use an example of, uh, from Uganda on, this on a community health worker program, the same one that was found to be efficient at small scale. Uh, we uh, scaled it up uh, at a larger scale and it showed, up, showed to be the case when we started uh, doing checks along the way that the capacity of the organization uh, uh, was uh, perhaps limiting and the, the organization could manage fully the, the, the scale-up program and have it as efficient. During this scale-up, uh, we experimented a little bit on a process where we allowed the NGO during the evaluation period to actually adapt and change the program throughout the evaluation period. So the optimal goal should be that we want the program to work when it's scaled up, uh, and how do we make that happen? Uh, and uh, is one way to make these organizations allow them for adjust adjusting across time, just like businesses do when they scale up things, they continuously monitor and continuously adopt and change, uh, and what other scientific methods can we use for scaling up? And then I'm going to end by, by quickly just touching upon what uh, Pascaline said. So another way of thinking about how to scale up these programs that we know work is uh, uh, some examples uh, that have been used is how can we think about the whole delivery chain from the medical intervention to the funding of the programs to the delivery of uh, these medical interventions to the broader population. And uh, as Pascaline said, we have a couple of examples of, uh, of these type of international initiatives that focus on addressing these systematic challenges for delivering healthcare uh, in low-income countries. PEPFAR is one. Another one is Gavi, which is the Global uh, Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. Michael Kramer and Rachel Glenister has uh, worked on advanced market commitments for vaccines. That's another example of uh, this type of initiative that tries to look at the systematic changes in, in healthcare delivery. And this is another area where I think we, we, we should look more into how to uh, align different international organizations in, in reaching out. So I'm actually uh, not going to conclude because that's summarizing what I've just done. And thank you so much. Um, we a little bit over time. Can we have five, seven minutes to just open to the floor? Um, please, if you're asking a question, start by introducing yourself and yeah, um, there and there. Mm. while allowing these surpluses to help people in the meantime and not be crowded out. Is 
Because of the little time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three questions, which is difficult because I know everybody wants to ask questions, but there is lunch afterwards. Three questions, and then I'm going to give e each of the speakers two minutes to respond to any combination of these questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mushfik Mubarak from Yale. Um, I, I, I love the talk, all, all, all three talks, uh, very nice framing. So uh, actually, let me pick up, since it's a combination question, let me just pick up on what Nava just said about systemic solutions, right? Um, so uh, I wonder, I mean, this is a discussion point for the whole room, that you know, the types of methods that we've been using in development economics for the past 20 years is more, you know, lends itself more to individual solutions and not so much to systemic solutions and whether we have a biased approach, you know, and that leads to, you know, Pascaline's uh, slide that, you know, we don't know enough about the systemic stuff, right? And I also really like Abhijit's uh, framing, like positive spiral framing, right? So let me just give an example from my country, Bangladesh, that, you know, we were, since in the 1970s, we were able to reduce infant mortality rate by about 87%, right? And that was all about low-hanging fruits. It is possible to take the simplest solutions, routine childhood immunizations, oral rehydration salt, out to rural areas. Like, remote African populations have been harder to reach, but that kind of revolution, I think, should, needs to be replicated. One last question. It's going to be very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Olivia. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pascaline, uh, Kelsey, and uh, Martina. My name is Tony Olobo from Nigeria. Uh, considering the issue of production loss time as a result of uh, the cost of illness that is directly related to occupation, uh, understanding the fact that the occupation also has a long, uh, has a major role to play in terms of the health status. I'm also thinking that we may need to be innovative with our insurance packages, probably to have a rethink of looking at it to be occupationally targeted health insurance packages so that that could directly fit in into the kind of work that they do since most of these health issues are also related to the occupation. Thank you. Okay, um, and yeah, then I can give each of the speakers about two minutes to just you know, respond to some of these um, questions and insights, and we'll close the session. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna go in order, so I think the Bangladesh example is, um, is, is great, but maybe Bangladesh is lucky in the sense that it doesn't suffer from some of the you know disease burden that's uh, you know uh, there in in Sub-Saharan Africa in, in particular. So you know malaria is not as much of an issue, and I found it as you know, deadly malaria um, and other you know other very specific uh, African uh, diseases are not there. Um, but you're right. You, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do this uh, low-hanging fruit. I'm just saying that it's 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 uh, it's not going to be enough in some contexts. Um, and uh, on the question of um, occupationally based uh, targeted insurance, so I completely agree with you that getting health insurance helps prevent, um, you know, catas catastrophic expenditures uh, if you have it, and, and um, helps you get healthier if you have access to it. But it's not going to solve the problem that you lose income while you are sick. Uh, and so for that, it's more like, I think, relating to social protection and the, the first session of this morning, like how, you know, we need to have a system so that even when you're self-employed, um, you know, days lost to illness are somehow uh, not um, uh, uh, directly linked to uh, loss of income and making sure that people have a safety net that helps them with that. And I think that can be dissociated from uh, health insurance per se, although some, some, some countries are innovating with the idea that you actually get some cash at the hospital when you go. Uh, to the hospital uh, for care, you also go home with some cash to help you deal with the uh, income shock. Um, and finally, on the very important question of like how do you uh, deal with uh, state capacity, so I, that's one of the you know biggest uh, challenges. I think again, here the example of India can be interesting. They are trying to do the uh, with the general rural emission. They are trying to expand access to uh, pipe water to everybody, but they are doing it in a way that right now the water itself is not actually clean. Um, and it doesn't come a couple of hours, you know, a day at best, sometimes a couple of hours a week. And so that's a, a situation where you definitely want to have both, you know, systems in, in, in parallel. But I think you're bringing up a very important um, issue more generally of like, you know, uh, 
a cautionary tale. Uh, I'm thinking of the work of uh, um, uh, Bowman et al. looking at the case of Bangladesh, where you know there was a move away from uh, you know uh, shallow water that was contaminated with E. coli towards uh, deep tube wells, and they realized there was arsenic in there. So then people ended up okay. So let me go back to the shallow water, and so you kind of uh, there was no institutional memory of the reasons why we had moved away from shallow water in the first place. Um, and so it's 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 very important to think about uh, you know keeping you know I mean. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, making sure that we don't, we don't, we don't throw, you know, <laughs> the baby with the bathwater, as, uh, as it said. And, and it's, it's. I'm not saying that there are any easy solutions. I just uh, think that it's something where thinking about health just by itself is not going to get there. And we need to, 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 to think, uh, you know, to bring in, you know, obviously political economy and many other issues to the table. Great. Um, I'll be brief and also kind of go backwards. I think one thing just um, that's starting to come up in terms of thinking about kind of occupational safety nets a bit uh, is, is the idea of either heat-based or potentially pollution-based uh, sort of sick days. Now, that works well, again, to connect to the, to the first panel, that works well if you're uh, working for an employer who can offer those kinds of benefits. I think it's a, you know, certainly a possibility and something that hopefully we'll see more of, but it leaves all of the self-employed uh, that we heard about this morning completely exposed. So that's another place where I think the, the kind of regressive, uh, you know, just the inequality enhancing aspect of, I'm gonna keep coming back to the environment, of uh, you know, the environmental quality challenges are, are going to be exacerbated that maybe they're innovative solutions, but to the extent that the occupational solutions are delivered through formal employment, that leaves a bunch of people off the table. Um, just one, one thought, I think, Nava, what you, you brought up. Um, one thing that's interesting about kind of urbanization trends is in some ways by bringing people into more concentrated places, it's easier to serve them. Mm -hmm. But it also means that to the extent that, for example, we're dependent on resources like water, mm -hmm. uh, it may be actually much, much harder to serve them. And so, you know, it, this region had a sort of near catastrophic drought not so long mm -hmm. ago and you know the city of Cape Town was in the international media for for trying to to how to respond to that um, Mexico City has just announced they're going to run out of water in June uh, at current rates and so you know I think I think there is this like two two edged thing of of providing the infrastructure needed to serve people with some health needs becomes easier with urbanization for others maybe we actually end up putting ourselves in a complete crisis, and I think water is, is potentially one of those. And I'm going to be even briefer. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have much more to say. I'm, I'm just going to reflect a little bit on, on what Mushvik said. So, um, so whether we, are, we have the method we use, so RCTs mainly, uh, it has, it's been kind of individual solution, biased approach. So yes, it has, but it was also necessary. We didn't know much. Uh, before on what worked and what did not work before we started doing RCTs and understanding what are the cost-effective uh, uh, kind of approaches to, to use, then the RCTs have, have helped us do those kind of cost-effectiveness and, and understanding what works. And now I think it's time for, for next steps, which uh, is uh, as many of what we talked about, systematic ch systemic cha challenges, scaling up, mm -hmm. uh, and, and whatnot. But the, the other thing is that um, what you talked about, so you said in Bangladesh you've been able to deal with child mortality. So when you look at, uh, if, if I just uh, think about Uganda, for example, immunization rates aren't very bad. Uh, people, kids are treated with uh, ORC when they have diarrhea and so on. So it's not like these services are, are not reaching them. Still, uh, we have half of the world's kids being uh, dying. They're dying in the in the sub-Saharan Africa region. But we also uh, we also know that 25% of the kids that die in sub-Saharan Africa they die from uh, low birth weight. Uh, very simple infections, mm. uh, things that, that, that might be, I don't know, thinking about what Abhijit said in his talk, that everything is kind of interconnected, but we haven't been able to deal with maternal mortality. And uh, if we can uh, make sure that mothers are more healthy when mm. they are pregnant, mm. uh, maybe Absolutely. we're able to fix a few of these right. kind of uh, child deaths that are happening in the first week and in the mm. first month, uh, simply because there's stronger children that are born. 
uh, thinking about this interconnectedness of, of different kind of health measures. I think that's a great way to uh, thoughtfully end this um, fantastic session. And um, we are then ready to proceed to lunch. Um, thank you in thank particular you so to the fantastic panel. Yeah.